It's the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. You are Locked On NBA, your daily NBA podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up and welcome to another episode of Locked on NBA Thursday. I am one of your hosts, Jackson Gatlin, host of Locked on Rockets. And with me today is Chris Manning, co-host of Locked on Cavs. What's up, Chris? How you doing? Doing good, man. In Vegas, this is my, you're coming in uh, to Vegas for Summer League. This is my last day in Las Vegas. I do have this nice Lakers colored Summer League hat because it's everything here is Lakers colored weirdly, but it's good, man. How are you? I'm great, man. I'm excited for this uh, episode. Matt Moore, unfortunately, could not be here with us today. We will uh, fill you in on what's going on with him later on. But we've got a lot to talk about before we get there. I uh, want to let you know today's episode is brought to you by rockauto.com. Amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need. Be sure to visit rockauto.com. Now, Chris, kind of laying the framework for what we're going to talk about today. I want to definitely touch base on what took place with yesterday's games, talk about Evan Mobley, talk about Jonathan Kaminga, Scotty Barnes, kind of what we've seen there. But I want to start with you and kind of get into just general, like either biggest surprises so far in Summer League or biggest takeaways that you've had through these first four days of Summer League games, Summer League action. And for me, where I you know kind of come away thinking is, this most recent draft class was really loaded with talent. And I mean, we knew, we knew kind of coming into the draft that obviously the top five were projected to be these really, really, you know, top tier talents, you know, any other year, these guys all would have been number one overall picks. And it seemingly we had like five of them in this draft. Uh, Mm -hmm. And now we're also seeing like the depth of the draft and how solid so many of these players have been throughout their summer league debuts. We've most, most players we've seen kind of two or so games out of so far. What are, what, what do you have? What have, what has kind of surprised you so far or your main takeaway from summer league to this point? I think it's just that it feels very good, I think, for this event to be back, right? Like, this is this is my first time um, at Summer League, which is good. But getting to talk to people that have come a lot, getting to talk to people with different teams, um, you know, primarily for me with the Cavs, but just getting to chat with other people around the league, they're saying, like, okay, this is just good that we're back. And you also just see on the court guys like Tyrese Maxey. He's like, he's just – he didn't get Summer League – Last year, due obviously due to the pandemic, but he looks incredible for Philadelphia. Like Philly's team, uh, I watched them play Dallas the other night. It was like Isaiah Joe, Tyrese Maxey, B Ball Paul Reed, and uh, Jane Springer, their first round pick. And they were just like, yeah, like all these guys are solid NBA players. They're really good. They're going to just crush through this and look really good. And some of the guys that didn't get Summer League that had NBA experience, I mean, you'll quickly kind of maybe being the other one, have looked really good. But the, the, the deaf point you make about the draft is right, too. I mean, I feel like I'm pandering to you here, but like Josh Christopher has been like a ton of fun for Houston. The times I've seen him, he's been going after it. He's had a lot of family in the arena and they've just been like loving every little thing he's doing. And he's like, yeah, like I, I maybe I'm the best player on the floor right now. Like he's just like kind of going at it and getting up in guys grill. But ev- pretty much everyone, um, I think is just really happy to be there and just getting to have this experience. I think it's, it's just sort of the prevailing takeaway is like, this is obviously maybe not the highest quality basketball you're going to see. There's a lot of guys, unfortunately, that will you know not be in rosters come come the fall. But everyone, I think, is just glad that this is back. Is kind of the big thing, you know. And I think too, right? This is it's such a unique event in the sense that you get this once a year opportunity with these guys of of really kind of. I don't want to say varying skill levels, but you get like a nice mix now of players who have either played like, you know, internationally college ball. You get the the G League guys with Jalen Green, Jonathan Kaminga now, uh, the, you know, the other guys who have you know, spent some time in the G League as well. And it's such it, there really isn't anything else like summer league basketball. And to be able to really take part in it. And as you said earlier, I just, I landed. And so this is my first day here. I'll be here for the next five or six days. And I'm really excited to actually like be in person live Mm -hmm. in the arena and experiencing, I think the biggest element of all this. And this is something that really impacted all the players this past season, right? Is not having fans in stadiums. Right. And there's definitely right. Going from the bubble to then playing in the NBA with, with no fans or very minimal fans and kind of going through that arduous process of getting back to some sense of normalcy. And now we finally have Summer League back, and there is a sense of normalcy. And like you mentioned, the players who didn't get to participate last year are you know, jumping into it this year. Like, for example, for the Rockets, K.J. Martin didn't get to participate last year. He's getting a shot at it this year. And it's funny to think of him as the Rockets, like, 
you know, veteran amongst this group of like 19 and 20 year olds, um, you know, leading the charge. But as far as how we've kind of navigated summer league to this point, who do you see as, as having been, I guess the best build of the, the, the top prospects so far of, of the, and we're going to kind of dive into each one. Cause I do want to talk about mainly the top five guys and, you know, maybe a little, a little bit further down the draft lottery as well, but, through this point, who do you think has played the best of all the top prospects? And I know this is going to be difficult for you and me with Jalen Green on the Rockets and Evan Mobley on the Cavs. So I'm going to be honest with you. My answer is not one of those two guys. Yeah, I I came away maybe most impressed with Kate Cunningham. Um, you know, Green scored more than the other night when they played. He, Green got to the final like, what, like 11 times in that game and was very aggressive. But Cade had these like two-way moments where you're just like, holy crap, like this guy is just going to become this big facilitator right away. And I look at, and I look, watch what he's playing, and it's like, this is really interesting two-way basketball. This is him just being a very creative player. And it's like, you're just hoping that like the guys he gets can make shots when he passes in the ball in the regular season. Like, you know, I, I feel like we could have a thing all year where it's like, Kay Cunningham he should be getting like nine, 10 assists a game, but it's like, he's just got his, his teammates are not getting on shots or whatever. So I, I would go with him. And that's like, obviously number one pick easy answer, but he's been awesome. A couple of times, um, the, the time I got to see him in person and he just, he just really popped for me in, in that game. Um, but I, I think to kind of, as you alluded to, I think all of the top five guys have actually had like real interesting moments. Like Suggs has maybe had some of the highlight plays, of Vegas so far. Mobley was much better in game two. Green is obviously putting up tons of points. I, Barnes has had like his, his celebrations after shots are like absolutely bizarre and very fun. But like, I, I think everyone has so far been pretty good. I, I, I come away thinking that so far of, of those top five prospects of the top five picks, I should say Jalen Suggs has thoroughly impressed me. Like in, in his games, he just has, <sighs> such a control of the game where he just feels like he's playing well beyond his years at this point. And Mm -hmm. you can all, you can kind of, I feel like you can kind of say the same for, for Cade Cunningham a little bit where they both just have a level of impact and control on the game when the ball's in their hands and, and how they, you know, really put their imprint on the, on these individual games. But for Suggs, I mean, he's just had some, you know, like you mentioned, had some really standout moments so far. So he's the guy so far, even more so than the Rockets' Jalen Green. I know I'm going to get some slander for that from from Rockets fans. But even more so than Jalen Green, I think Jalen Suggs has, you know, performed really, really well so far in Summer League. But I do want to take a moment to talk specifically about your guy, Evan Mobley, as well as we want to dive into Scotty Barnes and Jonathan Kaminga, because those were the kind of marquee games Uh, that we want to talk about here. But we've got a quick message from our friends over at Sweatblock. Because look, if you've ever been, you know, nervous heading out to an event, maybe it's a, you know, job interview or, you know, a first date. Chris, I'm I'm sure you've been there, right? Where you're you're really nervous leading into an event or something like that. Yeah. um, Honestly, considering how hot it is in Las Vegas, uh, I probably could use some Sweatblock when I got here, honestly. And honestly, considering how hot it is and humid it is, at all times in Houston, sweat block is definitely something that I've looked into and, and I'm and I'm glad I did because it's so simple. It's stronger and more effective than most clinical like antiperspirants. You just apply it the night before, you know, take care of all your stuff before you go to bed, apply it, put it on, and then you're good for about a week, sometimes even up to two weeks. It kind of varies person to person. But it's so easy to use. And the main point is, right, is you don't want to deal with those, you know, awkward, embarrassing moments where, you, again, you know, be it a job interview, a first date, you're meeting somebody for, for the first time, even if you're just going out trying to figure out what am I going to wear, all that, because you're worried about sweating through your clothes or anything like that. You can forget about all those worries with sweat block and you just need to go check it out. If you or someone you love is dealing with this, check out sweat block. You can get 20 percent off today at sweatblock.com with promo code locked on or at Amazon and CVS. So go check out Sweatblock at sweatblock.com. This episode is also brought to you by Rock Auto. And as Jackson, I definitely knows because all the Lockdown hosts are well-versed in this. With the ever-increasing numbers of makes and models out there, it is now impossible for your local chain auto parts store to stock all the parts you need. Why would you endure often pointless or seemingly intimidating questions like, is your Odyssey an LX or an EX? I don't know how to answer that and wait while the person behind the counter orders the parts for you on their computer, choosing only the brand their warehouse happens to carry. You have computers with access to rockauto.com at home, 
and in your pocket. You can save time and money when using Rock Auto. So why would you choose to spend 30%, 50%, or even 100% more for the same parts at a chain store or a car dealership when you could save a bunch of money? For example, a Honda Odyssey fuel pump is $353 from a standard chain store. It is only $216 at Rock Auto. You could do a lot, honestly, with that extra money. You could save it. You could take, go out to a nice dinner. If you're in Vegas, you could play some blackjack. I can do a lot of fun there. Rock Auto prices are reliably low for every customer, and they have everything you can need from brake parts to tail lamps, motor oil, and even new carpet. Go explore their easy-to-use website today and find the solution for your part needs. Go to rockauto.com right now and see all the parts available for your car or truck. Right locked on in their How Did You Hear About Us box so you know we sent you. Amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need. rockauto.com. And continuing on here at Locked on NBA Thursday, he is Chris Manning. I am Jackson Gatlin. Now, Chris, let's dive into your area of domain with the Cavaliers and with one Evan Mobley, because I think that, as you mentioned earlier, he you know played significantly better, moderately better, significantly better. Which word do you want to use here from game one to game two? I would say comfortable, uh, and with the caveat that the Cavs decided we're not going to bring a, a guy who can really pass the ball to summer league. Like, no disrespect to Isaac Okoro, who is awesome, um, has been awesome in summer league so far. It, I would say did a really good job on, on Jalen Suggs in game two. Suggs looked way more comfortable not being defended by Isaac uh, versus game one to game two. But, like, they did not bring someone to pass on the ball and the Cavs, I think for game two, we're like, okay, we need to adjust the strategy. We need to get him into spots that look a little better for him. And he looked better. Um, he, I think sprayed an ankle in game one. And so if you, people may have seen like he had like ice wrapped around his ankle after, after game two, I, I, my understanding is that he's fine, but he looked way better and he did, he did everything. And you also saw him, I think, get under his jump shot a little bit more. You could see in game one and even for bits of game two, where he was leaving his jump shot a little short. He was not getting his legs underneath his shot. And in game two, he did a much better job of actually completing some of the pick and pop and, and mid-range opportunities that he's going to get. Um, and you and you saw him also very clearly, I think, play the four, um, which is, I think, people worried about the Jared Allen thing. It's like, at least for now, he's not going to be a guy that they're going to have defend big. It's like he defended John Teske against Orlando, who's like a seven foot two fifty center instead and or did not defend Teske, excuse me, and defended Franz Wagner, who's like a three, four type in instead. So um, I think you're going to see him use that way, but he definitely to me looked way more comfortable in game two versus game one. You know, and I think what stood out to me in his second game was really his passing. And this is something that mm -hmm. I thought was kind of underrated coming into the draft for, for Evan Mobley was his ability to pass. And that was something that when I did a deep dive kind of film prep looking at Evan Mobley over at Locked on Rockets, uh, you know, trying to really understand how he utilizes his court vision. And, and I thought that was such an underrated part of his game. We saw him come away with six assists here in this one, um, you know. I really do think that's an element where he's able to really survey the court and once he's, whether he, whether he's, you know, once he's facing up, you know, gets in position, you know, he's got a, a level of patience and I think that's only going to get better with time, but I think it was really on display in this game. Yeah. I, I think you saw him and Isaac Okora in particular, just develop a nice chemistry and Lamar Stevens a little bit too. But if you're looking at guys that are actually going to matter for this Cavs team, whatever they're going to be in the fall, it is, Isaac and Evan are kind of the headliners here. And um, I, I think Isaac is now done at summer league, but you saw Isaac as a cutter and a slasher look pretty comfortable um, with Mobley and Mobley was seeing stuff. I mean, that one of the, I think it was like the top five, a top five play in sports center was Mobley from the elbow. Okora has a little back cut, gets a dunk, finishes over a guy. And like you're seeing Mobley be able to unlock some of that stuff. And for a Cleveland offense, that was very bad last year. That is very young. That has a lot of questions that I think needs that playmaking added to it. Like Darius Garland is taking steps, but he's not, I think can't carry the whole thing, right? Like that's not what he's going to do. And we'll see if Colin Saxon maybe can add another level to it, but Mobley's ability to pass. I, I think you're right in saying like, that is something that pops and it's something Cleveland really, really needs that They're not going to be a, a, a bottom of the barrel team again next season. What has been through through these you know first couple games with Mobley? What has been your biggest concern that you've seen out of him so far? Um, you know, just focusing on what, what you'd like to either see more of over these remaining summer league games, or a concern maybe you had coming in that he hasn't quite addressed yet with his play. I, I really think it's as simple as like I just want to see him play with a, a, someone who's going to really pass him the ball. Like I, I just really want to see him play with like an actual lead creator. No shade again to the guys that Cavs brought. 
they did not bring guys that are just going to show up and like run the offense and like orchestrate traffic a little bit. Like they really, really need that. And Mobley needs that because he's not going to bring the ball up every time. Um, you need guys that can get him entry passes at the elbow, outside on the perimeter, in the block if you want to do that. Although I don't, you know, post ups, whatever with him. He's really, really, really skinny. Um, I, I think like I just we're lacking that with him, right? Like Isaac has added some playmaking, but I don't think that's ever going to be something he does a ton of. I think you need him to, like, I want to see him play with Darius Garland. I want to see him play with Ricky Rubio. I want to see him, you know, Collins not at the level of those guys as a passer, but I want to see Colin Sexton, like, at least be able to throw him some passes and get the offense moving in that way. Like, that is just something that is really going to, I think, aid our understanding of what Mobley is going to be. And look, he also just needs to get bigger. I mean, he's 250 pounds. He's really skinny. Um, you can very much see how much bigger he can get. And he's talking about adding muscle to his frame. I feel like every time I've heard him talk since he got drafted, it's talking about how like he's going to be a much bigger problem once he adds muscle. And it's like, yeah, you can very much even see that now that they're not having him defend. Like they're having me find you Kagan Bailey, who like might not be on the roster defending centers and he's defending fours. He's on the perimeter. Um, he defended uh, Giannis Tena, the, the summer league legend from the Orlando magic the other day, because like they just didn't want him in the post. And I think, I think that is the thing. And it's, again, it's just a roster. I really just think it's a roster construction issue for Cleveland that you did just didn't bring one guy to throw him entry passes. Like, could they have just like not gotten Brandon Knight? Could they have borrowed like Cole Anthony for like a game? Like, can we just get, can we, can we get a loan in? Can we get the loan army in for summer league? I, I don't know. They just need that guy. I think. You know, and I, I feel like, why do I feel like Rockets and Cavs are kind of in the same boat there is they didn't bring like the Rockets didn't bring a, a legitimate point guard either. And the, so the I Rockets mean, are like we have we have 900 guys who are going to create for us. It's fine. We have Josh Christopher, Jalen Green, like they're they're going to do it. It's cool. We don't we and, and Sangoon is just absolutely balling. So like you don't you know, who needs who needs a point guard? Yeah. You know, we're we're gonna we're gonna take a second at the at the end of segment three to talk about our our surprise picks for you know non lottery draftees and, and who's stood out and uh, you know spoiler alert at who I'm gonna pick uh, no bias whatsoever but we're gonna save that for that for that moment let's let's talk a little bit before we move on to uh, Scotty Barnes Jonathan Kaminga and Raptors Warriors uh, again Jalen Suggs you know in, in this game I, I do think that you know I come away looking at what Suggs is able to do on the floor. And again, I keep coming back to just his command and control of the game. I really felt like Suggs coming in was almost like the, of the top prospects was almost going to be the one who was most ready to like play at the NBA level right away. And, And I mean, do you think I'm like overstepping my bounds when I say this, Chris, because I just looked at what he did in college and you know, how that was going to translate to the NBA level. And I think you could look at all the other kind of top guys and say, okay, there's some, like some questions here, um, you know, about certain aspects of their game, but past Cade, I thought Jalen Suggs was the most complete player at the top of the draft. And I think he's really displaying that in summer league so far, his ability to really do it all on both ends of the court. Yeah. I think in particular, the Warriors game, he was awesome. Um, he was, that was a close game. That was a game where like you saw, uh, both coaches for for I think Jamal Mosley for Orlando and I don't remember who's coaching the Warriors summer league team but they were like making adjustments where it's like at one point the Warriors were like okay we're gonna play Kuminga at the five we're done playing bigs and then the Magic immediately were like okay we're taking out uh Teske and we're gonna move Wagner to the five and like that was like a summer league adjustment I was like oh like they're actually gonna go small and and play this game with each other in summer league this is really fun and in that game and remind you he's playing on a team with Cole Anthony who is a second year player um, had some really strong performances last year, and he's playing with RJ Hampton, who's been in the league for a little bit. Obviously, you know, was in Denver, now in Orlando after the Aaron Gordon trade. But like, he's kind of like commanding that offense, and he's bigger in person than I, I think I realize. Like, he is a little thicker, he's a little more built. And seeing him he's that got, way, he's got, like like a, NBA, he's got like an NBA he's ready body, got an NBA body. He's got the NBA body right now. And you know, even even yesterday, where I watched him play play Cleveland, like he, I, I felt like maybe didn't have the same kind of impact he did against the, the Warriors, but he's still making plays, right? Like he had that that the tip dunk, uh, the, the follow-up tip dunk where he crashed offensive mm-hmm. glass. He was still getting some other dunks. He just has a really good command of the game, and he's not forcing things, right? Like he's a guy that I think you're going to see him in Orlando. If there's a night where like, hey, uh, you know, Jonathan Isaac, when he comes back from injury, he's feeling it. We're going to feed him. Um, if if RJ Hampton's having a good night and he's, he's hitting his threes, like we're going to get him shots. Like I feel like he's going to be that guy, and you see that now, and he's just got a command 
that is really, really impressive. And I'm sure Jamal Mosley has to be feeling like very happy with the fact that like his top pick, the guy he's going to be kind of really building around now on a, on a weird magic roster, like is going to be doing some good stuff and it, it's popping in summer league for sure. He's got that prototypical kind of like floor general air about him. And I, and I think that, you know, coming in, right, I, I comped him a lot to like a Kyle Lowry-esque, like a slightly bigger, more athletic, you know, Kyle Lowry and how I think he's going to develop slowly over time in the NBA. So it'll be great to see how that continues to improve and, and see where he walks away from. But we're going to talk about coming up. We want to get into Kaminga, Barnes, Warriors, Raptors. Going to get there after a message from our friends over at betonline.ag because BetOnline is the fastest and easiest way to bet on all of your sports action you got baseball season in full swing you can track all of that action over at bet online so before the next pitch be sure to visit betonline.ag you can get all the latest news odds and info for all your sporting needs they've got you covered for ufc mma you name it they've got it over at bet online so don't sit on the sidelines anymore it's time to get in on the action and you can do that using promo code locked on to receive a 50 percent welcome bonus on your very first deposit again that's promo code locked on l-o-c-k-e-d-o-n for a a 50% welcome bonus on your very first deposit. Bet online, you are online sportsbook experts. And final segment here at Locked On NBA Thursday, diving into Raptors, Warriors, Kaminga Barnes, and honestly, Chris, Scotty Barnes, when I, when one when he was picked at four, I thought that I, I didn't think it was a reach for Toronto, but I could kind of see where they were going with it. And mm-hmm. so far in summer league, is it his defense has been incredible in summer league. And I, I really think like when you watch him out on the court and how he impacts that side of the basketball, I walk away thinking, okay, I can, you can justify picking Scotty Barnes over Jalen Suggs. I feel like you maybe couldn't have said that on draft night. And I thought it was a bit of a reach then, but I can kind of see where the Raptors were going with that pick. Yeah, you, he's really long is the thing. It's like, you know, some like you see guys up close and it's it's for me that make maybe the biggest benefit of being here is getting to see guys in person again. And um, Kuming or excuse me, Barnes is like just a freakishly long dude. His legs are like just I don't even know like the right like analogy. It's like not quite Gumby. It's like maybe Gumby, but like I don't know if anyone um, under like my age like knows what Gumby is. Like do like 20 year olds that are watching us on YouTube like know what Gumby is? Like I don't know if this is even the right analogy anymore. We need to come up with with new with new words. But um he's been good and like that roster is interesting. Like you know they had Precious Achua get the debut for them yesterday. Um they had uh they have Malachi Flynn who's been very good. Like in Barnes I think is interesting. It's interesting that they're just clearly getting another like stretchy forward type. And it's like I, I was think like just thinking about I was talking with some some folks here and it's like it, it, like this feels like a team where Barnes is going to like get some shots up. He's going to like play a good defense and create a little bit, but it's like Toronto's team is going to be like a lot of Gary Trent Jr. Shooting and a lot of Fred Van Vliet shooting. And I, I Barnes is going to maybe hit some threes and stuff. And his celebrations are like v- a lot. Every time he scores, he's screaming. He's like making noises at the other team's bench. Very enthusiastic. It's just total big. energy guy. I mean, <laughs> yeah, he's a very, enthu- very enthusiastic is a good way of putting it. Um, I'm curious to see like what that roster kind of looks like and how he fits into it once we kind of get into the Nick, the actual Nick Nurse of it all come the fall. But he's been fun, and um, you you definitely kind of I think get the idea of like what Toronto was was going for and taking him over Suggs. Even if I I kind of agree with you, I think if I was them, I felt like Suggs made a ton of sense, and and obviously they didn't go in that direction. Also, a shout out Precious Achua, who you know obviously you know already you know spent some time at the NBA level with the Miami Heat, uh, but you know did have a really solid game with the Raptors. Thirteen points, eleven boards, shot five of ten from the floor. Um, you know, just Precious is a guy that in in all in all of last season's trade talks, uh, you know, constantly swirling about. You know, I was really. When we when when the news broke that Victor Oladipo was headed to Orlando, I was sitting there just praying. I was like, "It's precious coming back to Houston, please!" And you know, didn't unfortunately didn't coalesce that way. But uh, you know, Precious is a guy that I'm I'm pretty high on. I think he's got a, yeah. a really promising NBA career ahead of him. But on the other side of the aisle, we got Jonathan Kaminga, who is Chris. I'm going to be completely honest. When Jonathan Kaminga fell to the Warriors at number seven, I was just like, "Of course he's falling to the Warriors at number seven. Like. And it's just one of those moments where he uh, of the of all the, the the build top five prospects in this draft, right? He ha- he was clearly the guy who had one of, if not possibly the potentially highest ceilings of of those five, but then also potentially like the lowest floor of them. And so I thought it was just kind of like this perfect pick for the Warriors, where it's like, okay, well, if he pans out, great. If he doesn't, 
you know, oh, well, we tried. We, we, we took a swing at a guy. And so far, he's looked really solid. And in this game, I think that, you know, the, the efficiency is not quite where you want it, but he looks really comfortable in what he does out there on the floor. Like there's like a confidence to his play it, it, that I think, you know, he it has been conveyed through these first couple games. Yeah, I, I'm a Kuminga skeptic. I'm going to need to see it in the fall and kind of, I want to see what his role is going to be like, you know, playing with Draymond, playing with Steph, who obviously were there seeing him yesterday um, in person. I shouldn't, for, you know, Damian Lee was there as well. I shouldn't forget him. But Kuminga has these moments in every, the two times I've seen him here where he will mess up for like a couple of possessions in a row and then he'll do stuff on both ends of the floor where you're like holy crap like this guy like yeah has... he looks like he looks really good for a couple of possessions yeah. and then looks yeah. really questionable for a few possessions yeah and like i think that was like the read on him coming out of the g league um was just kind of like this is like you just don't always know what you're going to get with him but i do i just look at him and it's like the physical profiles there it pops in some really good times he's making he's like blocking shots taking the ball full court and just yamming it on dude's heads like he's been really fun um and he's in a he's in a position there where i think he's maybe getting to do a little more than he's probably going to do with clay and, and draymond and steph and it's I, I i really he will just be such a fascinating guy to follow just after the james wiseman experience who's obviously in, who i think had surgery last year and is not playing in summer league although he he is in vegas um he, he was on the bench yesterday but um i'll, I'll be curious to see like kind of how his development really works because like if he can if you just like squeeze like you can definitely talk yourself into him doing enough of these like flashes where you're like oh like this guy can help us now while our stars are still here we owe it to them to kind of do this and or or you know maybe they end up trading him or whatever but i you you see enough where you're just like okay like i understand why he's so like why a lot of people like him, even though there, there's some clear issues with kind of what he might be. And it definitely a guy that I don't, I didn't think belonged with, with the top five of the draft that we've already kind of talked through. Yeah. And I think, I think again, of those top five, that, the, that crazy high potential ceiling, that's why he was like up there. And again, you get into the physical profile and the moments where he does look like he's got it put together on the court, you know, those flashes look really incredible. But then you get to the moments where, you know, the turnovers, the, the, you know, the, the missed, some of the, the questionable shot attempts, like you're just like, okay, kind of seeing it now. Um, but it'll, I think, if you're talking about an organization that, you know, has shown a track record for homegrown talent and improving the guys that they draft themselves and, and really, you know, kind of building, building a franchise or building a, a, dy a dynasty, I should say from the ground up warriors are a prime example of somebody that did that already with, you know, their trio of Steph, mm -hmm. Clay and Dre. Um, and now they're getting a chance to do it again with some young, exciting prospects uh, under the tutelage of those guys. Right. So like, I mean, what better way to learn the game than than from some of the all time greats that have you know already played it, been there, done that, that kind of thing? A nice injection of youth to the Warriors uh, organization. But before we wrap this thing up, Chris, I want to focus on, or I want to ask you really quick because I've got my pick already in mind. But of the non lottery, <laughs> is it, is it, is it Josh Christopher? Pick, no, it's not Josh Christopher. It's 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 Alper and Shingun. But okay. I was going to ask okay. you, and and I'll, I'll spend a minute to rave about Shingun because. I, I've been thoroughly impressed with him. Although Josh Christopher has been almost as impressive. They've both been very pl pleasant surprises here, but this isn't a Rockets podcast, but um, <laughs> I, I just, I think the Rockets actually killed the draft. So, I mean, like, yeah. you know, we're talking summer league and you know, that's where we're at. Um, but where are you at? And if you had to pick your favorite talent outside of the lottery so far in, in summer league, who would you pick? Who do you think has been the most impressive to you? It's okay. I if had you a want to pick Josh Christopher or Alpern no, Well, no, uh, I had a lot of fun <laughs> watching Davion Mitchell. I, I I already shout out Josh Christopher. I've already pandered to, to you as I'm filling in here for Matt. But um, Davion Mitchell, watching, I've only seen. Yeah, I think I've only seen. Yeah, I've seen him play once. But he defended James Booknight, another uh, prospect from this class, who a lot of people thought might go as high as like number six. And Mitchell was up in book night to grill the whole time they were every time they were on the floor against each other and he was just like attacking him on defense like it wasn't just like really good physical defense it was just like i'm going to make your life awful the whole time you're on the floor i'm gonna hound you i'm going to poke the ball at you away from you i'm gonna like just do stuff he had a really well-rounded performance against charlotte and you know again i don't really exactly know what the kings are doing with picking him when they have fox and they have halliburton and like i don't know how he's gonna fit there exactly to kind of start his career and everything but like he, he was really, really good in that game and just a ton of fun. Obviously, he's a little older, a little more seasoned as a prospect compared to some of the guys, including Booknight that he's guarding. But 
he was just like, like you're like, oh, like I get it. I get the Mitchell thing now. If you're going to bring a guy into the league who's just going to hound dudes on defense and guard and attack in that way, it's like, yeah, like that guy's probably going to find a, a role in this league and stick for a while. I, w- I, I kind of question the Davion Mitchell pick for the Kings too, but I, I do think uh, of the one game that I caught, because like you, I, I saw I saw that game. Um, I, I was impressed with him, but that doesn't answer my question, Chris. I asked for a non-lottery pick, so somebody oh, okay, outside of the top okay, 14. Uh, well, well, You're I killing think me, man. Well, look, I just in my head. I was like the Kings took like tenth, and I was just like Sangoon. Sangoon would be a good one because he has been like, oh, like this guy's like kind of good. And he seems bigger than he's like what listed as six nine. I he's listed as six nine. There's no way he looks like he's six ten or six eleven. Like yeah, he he when he also plays bigger is the thing. Um, I I was very intrigued by the fact that he would be that. I would say hmm, the other another guy that in the outside of the lottery because I'm going to do my job that has been interesting. I, I, I think I got to go with Jalen Johnson because like, I don't know what to make of him, but he played, okay. he's played like well for, for Atlanta and like him and Sherby Cooper as a duo have been kind of interesting. And they've probably been the best two guys for Atlanta summer league team. I don't know if any of them is going to contribute. I don't know if, I mean, Cooper's on, I think a two way deal of all things. Even he was originally going to be a lottery pick. Um, so I would, I would go with, with kind of those, with those two as a duo in Atlanta And Cooper, obviously had a game winner. Um, he is doing some stuff for them and it's been interesting. And also, I will just also shout out Luca Garza hit a Dirk fadeaway against, against Houston. And I can't believe that he did it. And I also just like, Jackson, if I had to ask you, who is faster, Luca Garza or Sangoon? I don't know who actually runs faster. I can't tell because when they would when they were playing each other, they did the big center thing where it's like we're gonna have to just sprint full speed and look really awkward doing this to get down the floor. That was the one thing with both of them, and I can't really tell who's faster to be honest with you. Yeah, as far as the athleticism between those two guys, um, you know, it's it's kind of a giant question mark as to who you'd pick in a true uh, in a true foot race. Uh, I've had some moments watching Shingoon where. You know, he's great for what he is. He's got a great understanding of the game, a great feel for the game, you know, very high basketball IQ. But you can tell that there's very little to no athleticism there. And it feels so bad for me, like, to say that about, you know, a guy who was Turkish League MVP uh, and who's, you know, obviously got a good command of the game so far, you know, really polished post player. But there's times where he jumps up to, like, contest a shot and gets so little air. The movement on the court. Uh, I, I I have been pleasantly surprised with his defense. And I think that's where, you know, a gigantic question mark for, for Shingun coming in was, okay, like, what's he going to look like defensively? You know, can, is he going to be a big who's just going to get played off the floor? Is he going to get, you know, eaten up on switches? That kind of thing. And the Rockets coaching staff has just raved about what he's been able to do and, and kind of how he both – handles himself on switches, but also how he closes space and, you know, whether he's, you know, kind of, you know, following somebody on the pick and roll or something, or being a help defender, how he's able to close gaps a lot quicker than they were originally expecting for a guy, his size. And again, for, you know, somebody with his, you know, athleticism or lack thereof, I should say, um, you know, how he's able to rotate and, and effectively, you know, get to the right spots uh, defensively and, and still, you know, prevent these easy opportunities for other teams uh, through the first couple games. I mean, he's been, you know, really effective defensively. He's kind of been anchoring the Rockets defense, which if you had told me I was going to say Shingun is anchoring the Rockets summer league defense before we actually got through these first couple games, I would have said you're insane. That's, that's not a thing that's going to happen. Um, but he's my pick for the, you know, the, the prospects outside of the lottery, to be fair, he was a projected lottery pick that fell to 16. So there's a good reason for that, but I think that kind of wraps things up there. Chris, any final thoughts before we shut this thing down? Uh, I also just want to say it's been very funny watching the Blazers because they have Kenneth Reed, Emmanuel Moutier, and Michael Beasley on their roster. And it's like, sure, I guess this is a thing. Um, And also Brandon Knight's running point for the Brooklyn Nets in summer league. And it's just like, Oh, Brandon Knight somehow like tw- still only 29 years old. And I just like, kind of can't believe that that Brandon Knight is like not even 30 yet. And he's just here running summer league, trying to make a roster like good for good for Brandon. Happy for him. Kind of can't believe he's not like 32 years old or something. Rockets legend, Brandon Knight, like Ca- you know. Cavs, Cavs legend, Brandon Knight. Let's, let's, let's just put, look at this connective tissue here with the there Brandon Knight of it all. <laughs> all right. See, yeah, I mean, Porter were- junior Brandon Knight. And uh, I'm sure there's another one that we're forgetting. Dante we'll Axum, ex- technically. There we go. I was, I was there we go. see expression like tur- turtles all the way down. I was going to say Brandon Knights <laughs> all the way down. Like that's what it yes, is. Yes. 
Yes. All right, Chris, always a pleasure to talk to you. Thanks for joining me today on Locked on NBA. But if you haven't checked out our Locked on NBA YouTube channel, be sure to do that. Hit subscribe at the brand new YouTube channel. Hit subscribe wherever you listen to your podcast, be it Apple, Spotify, Google, the brand new Odyssey app, all those different locations. You can track Chris down on Twitter at CM, C, uh, CWM Rights. You can track me down on Twitter at JT Gatlin. Be sure to check out Locked on Cavs. Check out Locked on Rockets. But for today's episode of Locked on NBA Thursday, that is going to do it. As always, thank you so much for listening. And we look forward to having you back right here at Locked on NBA.